purpose they're going to use, and you know what system you're in of the three systems he has. Wait a minute, suppose are all the terms that, that you'd, whether you like it or not, you have for your idea of God. And now you're going for something beyond all of those names. You have to drop them. So the more you become familiar with the system, the easier it is to drop them. Or you will know where you should pl apply them appropriately, but not for this highest purpose. So therefore, he has a whole set of terms he's drawn from the Bible, symbolic terms of what to call God. Then he has divine names, like in this case. Talk about them. Right. Now, you also have the theological terms, the, what we call the theological terms, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the Trinity, the Three, One. So he has different terms, which you can then pull out, take a look at, and talk about meaningful within each of their particular contexts. Now, I have here the Divine Names, a very beautiful book. This is a, a, a very fine translation, by the way, of the uh, Shrine uh, translation, the Shrine of Wisdom from England. So here I'm just pulling one idea concerning life, two pages. Right. Next page. Concerning wisdom, intellect, reason, truth, faith. Each one of these he's going to talk about so you can see the necessity for certain ideas all fitting together. Then you'll know when it's appropriate. You know when it's not appropriate. Therefore, as it builds, you find what's appropriate. And as you're working up, you're left with fewer and fewer terms since you've already concerned yourself with a certain set. You've been able to identify them. You see in what kind of universe they're proper and which ones they're not. And so, of course, when you finally get up, next turning power, justice, and then concerning the great, the small, the same, the similar, the dissimilar, rest motion, inequality, which of course is Parmenides, the Plato's Parmenides. Concerning peace, what is meant by being itself, life itself, power itself, which is from Proclus. And the God of Gods, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. The last chapter concerning perfect and one. And when you're left with it, you're left with only two words, perfect and one. And then each one of those drops out, so you're left with nothing. <laughs> Now, let me, let me, I'd like to just, just quickly read one of them, which is a roll it. This is, a, as I say, this is only two pages, and uh, I can just read for a little bit here. Now let us praise the eternal life from which comes life itself and all life, and from which is imparted to all things, howsoever they participate in life, the life appropriate to each going to take the idea of life now and he's going to put it in different categories. First category. Now the life of the immortal angels and their immortality, their indestructible nature, their angelic perpetual motion are and subsist from it and for its sake. Wherefore they are called ever living, immortal, and yet not immortal, because they have not from themselves their immortal being and eternal life, but they proceed from the life-giving cause which creates and sustains all life. He's now going to go through a philosophical exploration of why you have to use terms in a certain way and understand them in a certain way. That's what he's doing. I'm going down to the, I'll just hit a couple of sentences from each paragraph. And it gives first to the self-subsistent life its essential life. And to the whole of life and to each living being it gives that which is adapted to its own nature. To the super-celestial lives the immaterial and the godlike, chainless immortality and their unswerving and 
uh, in errant perpetual motion, while its boundless overflow through its all prolific goodness extends even to the life of demons. So he's going to show how the idea of life, the basic principle of life, can be said to express itself throughout the entire universe. So he's going to show you in every one of these spheres how it is functioning, then he's going to make a statement about the whole, he's going to relate all the parts together in a meaningful way, now you know about life. Yeah, these are yeah. And interesting enough, they're very thin books. Like you have the whole mystical theology in five pages. Now look here, you know what this is interesting about? This is the most interesting thing. I wanted to now push it another step. What can you do? What else can you do with this? In today's intellectual world, the Neoplatonic thought is being used to explore the Gita, the Upanishads, Sri Aurobindo, Advaita Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta uh, uh, Samkara, or uh, uh, Shankara, it should be an H, Shankaracharya. It's also used to explore Judaism, Hindu thought, Buddhist thought, Gnostic thought, because this is the basic intellectual structure that is meaningful within itself, where all the terms are appropriate, interrelate to one another, have a mutual coherence together. Therefore, any system, to the degree that it's going to be intellectual, must not necessarily fit within it and can be used to explain it. Let me give you a problem here. In Buddhism, uh, there is a, in the uh, Abhidharma school, or Abhidharma Akosa school, they have a very major meditation system of four stages. And what they have is a form meditation and a formless meditation. Now, the way in which they describe these, especially Buddha Gosha, is very terse. That, what I mean by that is that there aren't many words used to describe it. They don't go at great length to try to explain all of the processes going on and how to understand it. They just virtually state it, very much like the Platform Sutra. So, the question then is, if you're involved in meditation, you go from the form meditation to the formless meditation. The whole goal is to finally reach a consciousness, a consciousness right, of infinite space. Then the next stage is to then have a, a formless meditation where you have no longer a consciousness of space, space drops out and all you have is a sense of the consciousness being infinite. Then you drop that, you drop that sense of consciousness and then you have only that sense of uh, nothingness. The last and the highest state is said to be where you drop both the perception and non-perception, using the word perception in the highest sense. Right? Now, in the literature, in the literature of comparative religion, there is the, there are a certain set of very interesting questions. Uh, let me first give you the form meditation. Uh, they have Sanskrit names for it, but the way they're traditionally expressed is a lot of more fun. All right? Think here of a beautiful 